One of the things I wanted to, and this is a selfish panel, I'll be honest, a selfish panel in that I wanted to talk to two people who understand what some of the movement of our technologies might be. The parallel and the metaphor of the automobile lays on top of some of the metaphors we've used to describe the web since the early 90s. How many of you remember what we called it the information super? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the metaphor that I'm going to build up the video would be brilliant, right? Like, that's not, that's something that many of us live through. And then the other one is surfing, right? These mobility kind of. One of the things that I think for us, um, and I'm going to hand this over now to the panelists, one of the things that came up recently that offers another metaphor for us to think about is this notion of containers. And this idea of how infrastructure is changing the way in which we think about the web. So the highway, the superhighway, was one way to imagine what we were doing when we went on those 90 boxes that you can see out there. How do we understand this notion of containerization and what that means for the web, particularly as instructors in technology? So that's my first kind of leading question. And I'm going to hand that over to Anne-Marie or Tony, feel free to jump in to talk about like when you were trying or if you were trying to explain what containerization means and how it works, how would you do that to a group of people um, who may not be familiar with the concept and how it works? For example, how many people could explain what containerization on the web means right now and what it might mean for the future of higher education and thinking about information systems? Okay, good. So now you know your audience. <laughs> yeah, we didn't put our hands up either, Jim. You've got a big <laughs> problem. I knew I picked the right people for the job. Do you want to take that one, Tony? Uh, I, could, I could try. So um, I work for the Open University. Uh, we're a distance learning organization. Um, so our students provide their own computing infrastructure. They, they essentially bring your own device students. Um, for students taking our courses, the OU provides students with a minimum specification of machine they must run, which could date back, the current one I think is something like a Windows 7 machine, quite a low spec thing. And we have to be able to cater for students with those computers. Um, we're supposed to be platform neutral, so our software is supposed to be able to run on Windows computers of whatever operating system, um, Mac computers, Linux boxes, anything. So one of the issues for us when we're providing software to students is how can we provide software to them in a way that all the students with their own devices are going to be able to run it. What containers do is they essentially provide um, an abstracted operating system. It's like a little operating system in its own box onto which we can install software and then the students can just run this box that contains its own operating system on their machines. So we essentially give them an operating system that we know and trust that runs on their computer, whichever one it is. So for us, the containerization route, we haven't deployed it yet, we haven't used it in any courses, offers for me a possibility of providing an environment where students can run their own things. Another advantage is that the same containers don't have to just run on a student's computer. They can also run in the cloud, on a server in the cloud. So if the applications are exposing themselves through a, a web interface, an HTTP, HTML interface, we can run those services um, on a cloud at the OU, or we could use a commercial host. Students can just click a button to launch a server remotely and then access this, this software that we want them to be able to use through their browser without any software installation at all. And that would be exactly the same code that they could run on their own machine in this container. The only thing I was going to add on top of that is, in my institution certainly, a, some of our uses are also a little bit more practical around developing stuff and having clean development environments and not spending lots of time um, building development environments, but particularly when we're trying to do code sprints or hackathons and bring other people who don't normally develop with us into the fold to not waste that precious time we have with them in building development environments, but be, to be able to pop up something pre-configured and just get going on the interesting stuff super fast is, is another thing that is kind of practically useful, but also quite exciting. Could I just add a compliment to that? <laughs> um, with um, open data, so I, I'm a um, 
play with open data a lot, and some of you may have heard of open data hackathons and, and data sprints, data explorations, where people come together and work on data sets for some common good. One of the huge issues there, these events often last the course of a day, 10 till 4. The first three or four hours could be spent setting up environments within which people could start to work on the data, which just completely you know, wastes half the day. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things that when I first heard about, so one of the big container, some of you may or may not have heard of it, and I was hoping this session would kind of introduce some of these concepts, push some of you to explore them, is this technology called Docker, Docker Container. And how much you do or don't know about Docker, you know, feel free to explore, but like the idea about Docker is a metaphor, right? This is the container, as Tony and Emily said, with the environment containerized, separate. And when you think about what containers did to revolutionize the way in which we move things around the world, right? With ships in the port of Baltimore, in the port of, you know, you name it, Los Angeles, to take that stuff, to organize it, right? And that metaphor has moved beyond to kind of help people conceptualize what this new infrastructure means. And a good example, Tony, that you just brought out is, what would it mean for you to go to your IT department Say, I need you to spin up a server to run a WordPress install. Like, what would be your response? What would be the response you might get, say, from IT? Yeah. No. <laughs> so I've had this experience where um, I got a blog installed and it was just vanilla, vanilla WordPress. You couldn't do anything else with it. And it was just like you might as well not have bothered, basically. Uh, I've been on Reclaim for like four or five years. I wasn't even expecting to read my stuff. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea here, too, is that, you know, it would take resources on IT, right? They would have to designate someone to set up a server, to create all the dependencies, to build the environment, and that would take days of work. Days of work. With the containerization system at its ideal, you could, if you had an environment like Tony suggested that was going to be deployed, you could install an app with WordPress, a WordPress multi-site that could run nearly instantaneously. And what that means for how we think about labor, of IT, what IT's cha changing role is, what our changing role is to develop, not just rolling out one app, but rolling out a variety of apps. And I'm really interested in this. I can't pretend to completely understand containerization, right? But for me, it's one of those discussions when I first heard about it, and people said to me, you know what this means in terms of revisioning what IT means? A, I didn't fully understand it, but B, I wanted to. Because I figured as an instructional technologist, this was key to the work I did on a regular basis. So part of the idea was kind of, how do we understand the infrastructure in which it presents itself, and what does it mean, what is a practical use for teaching and learning? One of, the, one of the obvious benefits, and you, you perhaps obliquely touched on it there, Jim, is that people like you may not have to build a Python server or, or whatever technology it is. I mean, you clearly could build a WordPress site from scratch if you needed to, but there's a bunch of stuff that you would find harder. And that's before you even get going teaching the thing it is that you want to teach. Um, and I think for a number of um, learning technologists, certainly, it... it it will remove an amount of unnecessary labor or repetitive labor or offer possibilities that are just not available at the moment. I mean, I have somebody, I have somebody who's running a pilot of Python notebooks at the moment would struggle to build a Python server, but is a perfectly competent and capable learning technologist and can cope with writing some Python notebooks and can certainly handle all the pedagogical side of what's going on there. But he, he couldn't get anywhere close to it if we hadn't containerized that stuff and made it simple and easy for students to just spin that up and get going on the actual learning we want them to do. So, just as well, there's, um, if you want to try software out, um, it can be hard. If you've got no resource and you want to try out a new application, um, you can't go to IT necessarily to say, could you spend a couple of days trying to get this complicated software installed and running somewhere uh, because I just want to try it out and I may or may not use it. And I may actually not even get around to trying it out. Um, with the applications that someone has already 
containerized for you. You can go to somewhere like Docker Hub, which is a, um, an open repository of places where people have published applications they've essentially bundled. You can just go and try things out um, with no, no effort at having to worry about installing the software on your own machine. You don't install the software on your own machine. There are no side effects. You're not going to put something on your machine that will break something else. You put something on your machine that runs in its own little box, this container, and when you're done with it, you just throw it away. You, you don't care. One of the things, too, on that note, that I was struck in 2014 was the first time I really came into contact with this. And I don't know if you remember that thing called the MOOC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's still, is that still live here? But one of the ideas behind the MOOC was that there would be these platforms that would provide it, Coursera, and one of the open source ones and so probably like many of you in this room, faculty may have come to you or you might be a faculty who was interested in it and wanted to try it out. So we got a request by faculty to try out um, the edX platform. Um, not knowing that, we went through IT, could you install it? Well, here's what it would require. Give me about three or four weeks, right? And that was legit. Like, I mean, that's not like them being like, no, I'm not going to do it. Like, they wanted to. Um, my partner, uh, Tim Owen, found on AWS an image of edX that he could deploy and we could give to a faculty to experiment with for two or three days and we could then turn that like turn it off basically destroy it mm -hmm. and we spent two dollars to have that thing running for three days for a community of faculty to experiment with a possible platform i mean think about what that means in terms of just iterating the possibilities for your community like a very practical, here's the image, you have three days, play with it, and then we'll roll it down if you like it, then we will spend that three weeks of IT time to spin it up. But if you don't, let's not waste that time. Right? Let's allow us to keep on it. Okay, so just to pick up on that, it's not just single applications as well. So one of the things with these containers is that you can wire them together. So if you've got, if you've got two systems you want to join together, so you've got, um, um, you might have a blogging platform or a, um, an editing environment of your own and you might want to connect it to a database so you can store the stuff in. There are mechanisms in place that allow you to just, to essentially just declare, I want this database and I want this authoring environment and I want you to wire them together. And so you can start to, you can start to build workbenches essentially that have got applications coupled together. And again, they only talk to each other. They don't talk to anything on your machine. They, there are no side effects that way. And it does to some degree, uh, Emery. No, no, go for it. I mean, it does to some degree, but we, one of the things that's been argued is because it's a container, because it's self-contained, the security risk arguably to affect the rest of your infrastructure is far less. So another element of that is how does it basically provide an infrastructure that's safe, right? Or potentially, you know, more insulated and inured to possible attacks. Oh, and then a safer space in which we can let students play. Because that's that's the issue with giving a number of our students space on our infrastructure to do coursework. You know, it all has to be ring fenced and locked down and separate from everything else because even, I mean, putting aside any unfounded, generally, fears we might have about what they do. It's about experimentation, and experimentation goes wrong more often than it goes right, isn't it? Because that's the point. Practicing is a big part of learning, and so it's a safe space in which to fail as well. And, and failure actually can be a little bit lower stakes, too, because you can have a spectacular fail, throw it away, spin another one back up, and okay, you're back to step one, but you're back to step one. You're not back to step zero, rebuilding everything to get back to the starting point. So you can repeat and repeat and repeat until you get it right. Yeah, no, I was just going to, to pick up on exactly that point, that, that you can make mistakes, you can mess up these environments. If you install software on your own desktop and you break it, what do you do? You have, you have to call IT support, tech tech help to help you out with the container, you switch it off and switch it on again, and it starts from scratch. It gives you switch it off and switch it on. One of the things we talked, and you may not all believe this, but we prepared. One of the things we talked about um, leading up to this discussion is VMware on the virtual desktop, and what are some of the kind of implications of virtual desktop versus having these cloud-based container-pop-ready um, applications. 
Can we speak a little bit about the limits of the virtual desktop and why this might offer at least one possibility as an alternative? I think it's just simpler. I mean, you. The conversation we had last night about virtual desktop, we've been waiting a few years in my institution to get a decent virtual desktop service to deliver software out primarily to students, actually, but also to deal with clinicians working in NHS sites where it's quite difficult to use their own computers. The NHS example, I think, is still quite a good example for a virtual desktop. Um, but for a lot of what our students need to do, we were doing all that work to push a desktop in order to push a stats package or to push, you know, it, it's actually the, the software on the desktop rather than the desktop themselves because they've already got a computer. That's what they're accessing this stuff through. There's a hell of a lot of duplica duplication there. And so I think in from everything I'm seeing now, uh, it offers us the possibility of packaging and deploying stuff to students remotely a lot faster, an awful lot faster. And actually, as Tony said, it doesn't even need to be on their desktop. We can put this stuff, if we have access to the right kind of service infra server infrastructure, we can put this stuff into the cloud. They can access it wherever. They perhaps might even get some persistent storage. So whatever they do, they can come back and pick up where they left off. Um, and we can get it out there much, much quicker. And again, if it's back to that, you know, how long does it how long does it take and how much experimentation and exploration can we do? How many of these interesting in cycles can we get in in the short period of time we have to spend with colleagues or learners or whoever? So just pick up on that more and more applications as well expose um, their interfaces through a browser. So there is no need necessarily to run it on the desktop. If you run it on the desktop, you've got to launch a browser within which to view the interface. So things that come natively through the browser, there is no need for a desktop if you assume the browser. One of the real limits that we've come up against, speaking from the work we've done at the University of Maryland, Washington, and now with at uh, East Bank Hosting, we work primarily with what would be called the land environment. And the breakdown of a land environment is it's a server stack that has Linux, Apache, MySQL, and usually Perl, PHP, or Python, which are the kind of um, languages one of the things that this, I think, revolution opens up is there's a whole new kind of wave of applications that are written in languages that aren't supported in those environments. For example, Discourse as a forum, right? Ghost as a blogging platform. There are many, many, many applications that your faculty and your students might want to use for their teaching and learning environments. But here before, you could get cheap shared hosting that would do PHP um, and Python and maybe some Perl. But you couldn't get a cheap platform that anyone could really do out of the box that would do Ruby or Node.js, right? And so one of the things that this possibly opens up is a whole new kind of generation of applications that we couldn't support heretofore for teaching and learning. And there are a bunch of those applications, I've named a few, but one of the ones that I think all three of us have been discussing to some degree is, um, and I, I'm really, I'm still like, I'm a newbie here. I'm trying to wrap my head around these things called Jupyter Notebooks. And it just so happens that I brought together two people who have some extensive experience with not only running them, but even running them at the institutional level. So I'd love to kind of move some of this to talk about these new infrastructures over and open up the options for new applications for teaching and learning. Jupyter Notebooks. I'm going to let you go first on Jupyter Notebooks, Tony. I can talk about it. You can actually do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> so. Right. Um, so has anyone heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Just OK, we've got two or three. So Jupyter Notebooks are a, um, an environment that you access through a web browser. Um, it's based on a, a notebook metaphor where you can... It harkens back to the original days of the web or the early inspiration for the web as being a read-write mechanism. So you've got a, a web page, essentially, that you, it's got two sorts of, of object in it. Um, there are text editing cells where you can just double click on a cell, you can write some, some text in a language called Markdown, which is a really simple form of markup language. Essentially, you just write, you write normal words and you emphasize things by putting asterisks around them or, or underlining them or, or putting hashtags to denote headers. It's really simple, 
simple text language, and when you run these, these markdown cells, it renders as HTML. So it essentially gives you a quick way into publishing HTML pages. These things are interactive. You double click on the cell, it gives you an editing box, you write your words, you hit play, and you've got an HTML rendered web page. There's another sort of cell in the notebooks, and that's a code cell. And what that allows you to do is, is write um, executable program code, software, um, that you can run somewhere. It might be Python code, it might be PHP. The language doesn't particularly matter. You can run this code, um, get the response back from executing the code, and display that in line within the notebook. And one of the nice things about the, the notebook machinery is it's, it's a rich interface. You can write program code that will return things like images, or will return things like movies, or will return things like audio files, or will return things like charts, um, scientific data charts, and these will be rendered in the page for you. So if you're, if you're writing educational materials, or if you're doing research, you can write some text, have it render as HTML, you can write some program code to actually do something, to create a media object, or to analyze a data file that you've imported, and it will then render the output directly in the notebook for you. So it's, it's a read-write interface. The nice thing about the code cells on the back is you can set the notebooks up to run with pretty much any language you can imagine. Someone has written a backend that will talk to that notebook interface that allows you to run code of whatever language you like. So you've got this environment now. Traditionally, if you were, if you were running a web page, you would write an HTML page in a browser. If you wanted to do codey things, you'd have to use JavaScript. Now you can actually do your editing live within the page, and you can also run code in any language you choose to. So. Yeah, that's an excellent description. Yeah. <laughs> Did somebody just film that? Because that would be so handy to play back. <laughs> and I think the benefit for, for that in a teaching and learning environment is you, it's then an object that you can give somebody to play with. So the code that has been written or the data that's been imported is also editable. Yeah. So you can give somebody something that demonstrates how to carry out an activity and then let them play. Yeah. Let them change it, let them modify it. Uh, so it's it's a teaching, it's an interactive teaching object. It's a, it's a piece of information. It can be a tool all at the same time. Yeah. The, it get the power of, or the potential of it is quite significant. Uh, more than something like a cell, like a spreadsheet. Because it sounds like it's a cell and then you put information <laughs> in. Like, what's the next, why is it different? <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's not made by Microsoft, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> Go on, Tony. So I, th I think one of the things about Excel is um, if you've got a complicated spreadsheet, maybe lots of tabs, and you give it to someone, um, where do they start to read it, to understand it? Where do, where do you start? The thing about the notebooks is that they're a, they're a linear medium. They're there, they encourage you to write a narrative. If you're doing a piece of data analysis and you're doing it in a spreadsheet, if you're creating a spreadsheet for, for data analysis yourself, you as the designer of the spreadsheet engage in a linear process. You write something in one cell, you do some data, you, you do a sequence of actions yourself, but your finished artifact is, it can't be read as a linear document. You have no idea. If I give it to you, you don't know where I started writing it, you don't know where I finished writing it. You don't know, it's hard for you to debug. The notebooks are a linear medium. And, and the, the notebooks were originally designed to support um, computational research working with data sets, two-dimensional tabular data sets, and there's a lot of software um, code around for handling those, rendering, the, with rendering it, and working with it in exactly the same way you would in a spreadsheet, writing the same sorts of formulae exactly. The only thing is that rather than writing a formula in this cell and a formula in that cell and one in another tab and one in another sheet that references a workbook somewhere else, and in the, the notebook, you've got a linear sequence of operations, get this data, do this to it, and you can read it back as a linear thing then. I mean, you can do that if you write a module in VBA and, and or the, use the net framework in an Excel, but that's, that's not the point. I, I mean, what, you, what you've got real power of is you've got the full use of the language. So if you've got a site which exposes an API, like with you media sites do, then you can write stuff in Jupyter Notepad in Python, for example, that actually interrogates that API and interacts with it, and you can read and write Wikipedia pages, you can, you can get data out of Wikidata, and you can bring that together and do the analysis from a completely separate site that 
Excel just hasn't got the power to do. Well, another thing is how many people here look at educational journals ever? Anyone? Just a few, maybe. And how many times have you opened a paper and it's just a spreadsheet? Ever? Ne never. <laughs> never. Right. So a notebook, you, you yeah. write the sort of thing you see in a journal. Yeah. The only thing is it's got all the analysis in the notebook as well. So someone can look at the source of, you can see this educational report that might have charts in it and might reference data sets. You could go to the notebook that produced that document and it would show you what the data was and it would show you what the functions were that were used to generate those charts. Those charts weren't created by anything other than the content of the notebook. Yeah. And the reason... And the reason I think this offers so much promise, it, it, part of the conversation we, we've had before and we had again last night, is that when we think of across the subject areas that are taught in our institutions, the, the push for computational data handling skills across all subject areas I think is increasing. And how do we support disciplines who haven't had a tradition of computational data handling, haven't had a, a computational tradition at all, how do we support those disciplines to get into this space? And I think that's where notebooks are, are massively interesting. I was fiddling around with some last night after our conversation and found a really neat little one that just does headline scraping from Upworthy. And you, I mean, you could change that to be just about any news site you wanted to. So if you're a media student and you're trying to uh, do some kind of analysis, I don't know, clickbaity headlines <laughs> or something, and you're trying to scrape data, well, there's a tool straight away. And you can change that. You can understand how that tool works. You can change that tool and you can do stuff at a scale using computation that you couldn't do by hand and, and that's where the push for data handling computation into areas like digital humanities comes in it allows us new areas of or new r routes to analysis of information at a scale we've never had before and i absolutely think notebooks are are how we're going to do that which is why we're running them as an institutional service now we have we have a service at Edinburgh called Notable, um, which is run by our colleagues in Edina, who are our kind of inward and outward facing part of the university. They supply services to the, the sector as well. So they've got infrastructure experience of running things at scale, which means they're well placed to do this for us. So they are running us a, a, a service which we've plugged into the virtual learning environment. So if you're teaching something, you want Jupyter Notebooks, you stick a tool link in the VLE, it does an LTI pass through to the notebook server, sets up the notebook, sets up the user account and the students walk through at the moment into an empty space, so the next bit we've got to do is put in some tools that allow instructors to push materials out. Right now the students just have to download and upload something from GitHub or wherever the materials are stored to, to get their kind of starter notebook. Um, yeah, and those are spun up in Docker containers and then at once the students are finished doing whatever they're doing, those Docker containers are shut back down. And that's institutionally what makes this doable in terms of kind of resource and cost. So we've got about 500 students piloting the service at the moment. We've only ever got about 150 of them actually using it at any point in time. So we're able to manage the resource on the server infrastructure. So the cost of running this service is manageable and maintainable for us as well. For research, yes. For research, and it's moved beyond that now. Yeah. In terms of, for example, journalist students, social scientists, this would be a tool akin to, you know, how would, if, if you were a technologist or you were a faculty member and you were thinking, what am I going to do with something like a Jupiter notebook? <coughs> right? What are some of the examples just you all have seen or you all have played with mm -hmm. um, that might focus in on it? I'm interested in this because Jupiter notebooks is something that I've heard about. And it's starting to gain some real momentum as a technology. And I was hoping this session would help us understand like, what does it mean, why would it be important, and what can we think about? And what would be an example we could show people we were working with to get them excited about it? Go for it. OK, <laughs> so a recent one is um, The Economist. Um, the Economist magazine um, published something each year called the Big Mac Index. Has anyone heard of the Big Mac Index? Yeah, no. So the, the Big Mac Index, it was sort of a, a jokey economic tool that has 
some sort of power, I think. The idea was that um, exchange rates between currencies should balance so that the cost of a Big Mac is equivalent. So it, it's sort of, you look at the price of, of a Big Mac in different currencies and that should give you, um, there should be some sort of parity. The Big Mac should cost the same everywhere. And the, the Economist published the model behind this each year um, and it, the model was traditionally done in a spreadsheet. So that's where they worked out the calculations. This year, um, along with lots of other news organisations, the, um, the Economist have published the model, as they do each year in a news story, but they also published the working for it, um, and they did the working for it in a Jupyter notebook. So you can go to the Economist GitHub website, and you can look up the notebook where they've got the model for generating the Big Mac index. So there they're using the tool to produce a piece of analysis that they report on within the magazine and interested citizens can go and essentially look at the working and check the working. So it's opening up journalism, it's making it more transparent because it's a means by which, it's, it's a medium that, that people can um, use and avail themselves of to see how people mm -hmm. are doing these. And that was my mm. first ever encounter with Jupyter Notebooks, four years ago at MozFest, when right. they were still called IPython Notebooks. Somebody who had US voting data in a Jupyter Notebook. And immediately you could start playing with the data and the calculation of the data and understand how elections work and understand how elections might play out by modelling different ideas in the data. Now that's really powerful in terms of understanding democracy and how democracy works. That that just, yeah, that was a real moment. And I think the, the example you've just given of that transparency that you can get and that ability to play and almost simulate stuff and play around with scenarios is really interesting. So uh, another example is that um, the OU, we, we produce one course on data analysis and management and there we um, give students materials that they read. It looks like text uh, that you'd read in a book delivered through the VLE, but we also publish a complementary set of practical activities as Jupyter Notebooks, and these blend instructional text, so you need hundreds of words of text, with executable code that the students can run themselves, and then um, blank code cells where we get students to write their own code and do their own activities. So we can use the notebooks as a, an instructional medium. We can use it to present essentially finished educational wares, but they can also be used interactively by the students and they can be customised with the students. They can be used for assessment by the students. I think you're looking at automated pathways for this. We are, yeah, we're looking at NB Grader, which is a, um, yeah, a a tool that will do some automated assessment of code in those code cells. I think, as I understand it, you can then start to set up notebooks to have, what as you've described, the, the cells that can or can't be changed by students, and you can assign some sort of grading um, structure to the cells that the students aren't are able to change so they can write their code, execute their code and get some sort of feedback in the form of a mark as well as the answer that they, they get, whether it be right or wrong which is quite interesting, and particularly if you're trying to teach computation at scale or you're trying to give students, di I mean, there's formal assessment, but there's also that diagnostic element again. Yeah. Um, you can take it a step further from here's your output to here's your output and it was right, or here's your output and it was wrong, which is kind of useful. Try again. <laughs> so not only does Jupyter Notebooks represent a kind of a shift in how we maybe disclose data, how we can track the narrative that that data comes to, but also it's a, arguably a teaching platform yes. in and of itself to think about data literacy or literacy more general on the web uh, for economists. Yeah. So I hope you all are taking notes. <laughs> and we have a question. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. Thanks so much, Tony, for being so articulate and describing it for um, a non-coding practitioner. Thanks. aesthetic sense as much as a data analytic sense. Like a, maybe as a, to create generators that are sort of ironic or parodic or this kind of thing. And if not, then I might get in there and try and do it. Tony, give me a second to come back. 
Matt or Anne Marie hold hand off. Well, yep. one one of the things Tony showed me earlier was um, a, a package that would allow music generation. So immediately the idea that you could have mixed media genera generated by what was going on inside that document becomes quite exciting. I mean, put, putting aside, it doesn't just have to be words that it's generating, it doesn't just have to be data that it's generating, it could be all sorts of things. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I've been exploring is um, trying to start to pull together sets of notebooks that that provide examples of um, topic-specific or subject-specific activities or, or things that you can author in the notebooks. So um, you mentioned one, which is a, a set of um, a, a package that allows you to essentially uh, just write strings of music and it will render the musical score and also generate an audio file so you can play it. And if you just want to change the sequence of notes, change the notes. Um, but there's, there's lots of things for other domains as well. So I've been looking particularly at chemistry and lots of people have, have built various packages that allow you to just essentially put in um, the uh, molecular description, description of a molecule H to A or something. And then with a, a single click you can generate um, a molecular diagram or you can generate a three-dimensional molecular diagram that you can turn and look around. And again, you just put in the, the, the formula. Um, there are things for generating um, images, charts. I built a little example. I was looking at an art history course, and the art history course was saying, well, compare these two images to see how bright they are without just saying what bright was, and look at the color palette. So I just built a little thing that allowed you to take an image, and it gave you, it generated the palette from the image for you, so you could look at this abstract representation of the palettes. Um, there's a toolkit for analyzing classical languages and doing natural language analysis on Latin or Greek. So you can, again, use the, the, the notebook medium to not only generate um, exercises and activities, um, semi-automate the production of those, but then also allow the students to start exploring and engaging with them themselves. I don't think it will go out on the the stream um so in terms of um the the average teacher lecturer creating content on this how viable is that uh, given that some programming is required say if you wanted to create something that had a narrative or interactive content how straightforward is that <laughs> go on <laughs> we, we, we were just chatting before this um it goes back to you probably don't remember anyone in here. Um, the early days of the web. Um, the web took off really, really quickly because of a thing called view source. Still in browsers today. You can go onto a web page, you can look at the pretty web page, but you can, you can click on uh, one of the tabs, you can find the view source thing, and you look at, look, can look at the HTML code that allows you to, that, that generates that page. If you look at HTML source of pages today, it's horrible. It, it takes a lot of skill to know where to look to make any sense of it at all, uh, often. But back in the original days of the web, it was quite easy. The, there was small amounts of sort of computer bits of code. Then there was the words you could see rendered on the HTML page. You could see a, a web page you liked. You could look at the source. You could spot the words you wanted to change so that the page said what you want rather than what it originally said. Just change those words and hope for the best with the rest of it. And it would work. And the notebooks, at the moment, I think we're at the stage of people starting to put together teaching notebooks and example notebooks that are exactly the same. That there are simple examples that you, can, you wouldn't necessarily understand all the code, but you would spot the bits you want to change to make the change you want to effect. So you can copy and paste. You can, you can, there's there's and millions of notebooks on GitHub. You can just look at them, copy and paste, change the and old I word. And, and I think that's where the combination of notebooks sharing and some of the virtualization technologies, container technologies, really come into their own because to run a notebook, you have to have an infrastructure to run a notebook. You have to find an example of a notebook somewhere. And all of this stuff is that much easier to do now. You don't have to build a Python server. You can run, uh, if you don't have something like I have at Edinburgh, there are options for running them on the cloud. Um, that are pretty simple to get started with. If you're prepared to search through GitHub, you will find something there that you can play with and will get you started. I'm not going to pretend that there isn't some 
computational and learning overhead involved there is um but there's nothing i have a degree in english and scottish literature right and i've managed it so i think that if you can read you can probably figure it out and and y again you can try it and if it's if it doesn't work you just reset and try again and and there's no danger in it you're not going to mess it up so badly that you can't go back and start again i think that as well the notebooks encourage you to write a line of code at a time so rather than a, a, a lot of code lots and lots of lines of code and you don't know what any of it does if you look at lots of notebooks there'll be some explanatory text there will be one line that there might be an input there'll be a line of code and then there will be the output of that line of code. Then there'll be another line of code which takes the output from the previous cell and the output from that line. So you can, you can see what each line of code has done. And the lines of code are quite powerful and the levels of abstraction at which they work are increasingly high. So it, you, you can just you know, make a simple command statements that achieve a lot with very, very little. The machinery is all hidden on the back. And if you want to try the notebooks, try.jupyter.org. Jupyter spelled J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. Um, if you've got a Microsoft account, notebooks.azure.com, you can try notebooks on there. And we have gotten used to copying and pasting code, right? Embed code for YouTube, right? Like it's not, I don't think like we're completely outside of that. Um, but I think the environment opens up, for me, just a new kind of almost frontier for what, what could be um, spaces to help us think through digital literacy and web literacy and computational thinking in ways we really aren't right now. I'm sorry. One of the things that you, you can actually find is that the code that's been written, so for looking at Wikipedia, we have something called PyWikiWiki, which is a Python, it's a vast program that trawls through Wikipedia pages and does jobs. Now that runs in the Jupyter Network. And there's tutorials for it. And that's really beautiful. Because somebody's taken the time to write a tutorial. So common applications are eventually are attracting people who are giving you a tutorial on how to use it. So you don't have to change it, says change this one, change it, put your put your login name here so that you can just log in on and go through. And with a small amount of configuration that you can pick up <coughs> and you can find a YouTube video on how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, the corollary of that is if you produce something that's useful, you make the tutorial as well. And we. We were chatting about just exactly that earlier as well. You spotted that some of the APIs that you tap into from platform providers yeah. were start they were switching away from static documentation to making the help information notebooks because you can have here's how to use the API. Here's some code. Here's the API. Oh, look! You just used the API, <laughs> and and actually, that's much more maintainable in the long term as well. Because as those APIs change, that stuff will break in a way that text, plain text documentation won't. I don't know how many times you've read a set of instructions, tried something, and it doesn't work because the software's changed and nobody's written them, and and it becomes self self healing, self testing. I think it ups the quality of what we might be using. Yes, I mean, I th I think of the it's. The notebooks are live documents that they they produce they produce their own outputs and and so rather than writing something like you say documentation that goes stale each time you run the piece of documentation running in a notebook um, if it stopped working you get an error message it you know so you know that it's broken and you can go and fix it and you're encouraged to fix it because the the medium is read writable anyway you double click and edit um, so you can try to fix the thing that's told you it's broken you don't you're not misled. Go and take mine first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm, so, mm, I have some bit of experience with notebooks, and mm, at the last Jupiter Conf, uh, there was a big talk about this guy that I liked it, the the bad sides of the notebooks. Yeah. I mean, in in my opinion, the fact that basically Jupyter notebooks don't uh, don't force the sequentiality that you usually have in code is 
not a powerful abstraction for teaching code to young people because I mean when you write basically the code that I've seen in Jupyter notebooks don't reflect the the good practices of writing code for engineers and professionals because whenever you run a cell it doesn't matter the the cells that were there before there's a lot of hidden state in Jupyter notebooks um, reasoning about this hidden state shouldn't be something um, it is is a, bi a big challenge when you uh, teach programming I mean the the first programming course at the MIT was about the functional language that doesn't have any state in it so I mean these are my considerations about notebooks right now okay so I pick up on that so this is particularly it's about the mechanics of how the notebooks work that you, you've got program lines of program code that you execute and you can execute them one at a time and and your natural way of executing would, these would be to run the first line and then the second line and then the third line and then the fourth line in the native um, Jupiter, and, and things might be happening on the back you change the values of various things around the back and you can't actually see what those values are you print out the value at the time you run the line of code, the value might change, but the display of it that you've, you've already run doesn't update. Um, so there's various ways around. This, this is a particularly a problem when you're teaching people to write, when you're teaching people programming. Um, but for me, a large part of what the notebooks afford is they provide an environment for people who don't consider themselves to be, won't ever consider themselves to be programmers, writing complex programs. It's an environment that affords a, a, a computational environment. It provides these people with a medium within which they can execute single lines of code that do a particular task and generate an output. Um, and so they can be used for teaching coding. There is lots of issues around that. There are ways you can fudge it because you can constrain the notebook so that it will only execute cells in order. Um, so you can, you can work around some of the issues. Um, but for me, the, the notebooks are providing this environment for allowing people who don't consider themselves to code, don't want to write, write large amounts of code. They just want to do one line that does one thing on the thing that they've seen before. Um, so. Yes, there are issues, but it's also a medium that affords uh, a medium that people can use who aren't programmers. And the way you can use the, the, the notebooks themselves, it's quite easy to get into your own personal workflows where you always say, I want to st I'm going to run this line of code now, but I want to run it in such a way that it completely wipes the slate, slate for everything that's gone before. It runs all the lines of code before this one and then runs this code so it will always run correctly and you can enforce that yourself with a you know your own work practice um, you could write an extension to the notebook that enforces that behavior on the user anyway so it will be correct in its execution order but that's a good point there are issues but the issues are, are some of the biggest issues are for people who want to do programming a traditional way or write big programs and they're not an ideal environment for that they're an ideal environment for writing little lines of code that do a particular thing yeah, i mean where we're, where we're using them in programming it's about introductory level programming it's about stepping somebody in getting some foundations down and then stepping quite quickly out into something bigger a more substantial and a wider set of tools um, but you're, to your point earlier about where these have come from, from the kind of open science space, and it, it, it's about being, it's about showing you're working as much as anything, and about having transparency and reproducibility as well. That was one of the big um, benefits that you could reproduce somebody else's um, experiment, see how they'd done it, understand how they'd done it, be satisfied that they'd done it right, not just that their code was right, but that their thinking was right, because that's what you can encapsulate in the notebook. Not just not just the code that I ran and the data that I used, but why I made these choices, what I did, why I did it this way, the problems I encountered, the ways in which I worked around that, the slightly fudgy answer I came to in the end and all the caveats for why I think that's the right thing to do. Um, and that's something that isn't captured in code in and of itself. 
So I think even, even if you did step out into another environment to do a larger piece of work, you might still do the write-up in something like a notebook to kind of explain what you did and why you did it. You might have something else somewhere else, a bigger, more complete thing, but you might still use it as some kind of write-up or reflective tool to think about why you've done what you've done the way you've done it. God, we might get programmers doing reflective writing. That is, if it I could works. achieve that in a computer science course. It does. It harkens back to a notion called literate programming, where your programs, it, you write it as a narrative. Um. Well, and also, I mean, the point you made, Edward, is, is worth thinking about, like, the way in which you have to narrate how your data was constructed, given how much we're now a data-driven society that's taking some of this stuff when we talk about higher ed and personalized learning. It's like, so what we're saying, it's no longer a black box. Of, here's the data, but here's how the data came. Here are the algorithms we ran it through. Here's the logic behind the person who programmed it. Like, laying all that stuff bare is also, in some ways, kind of an ethical like framework for thinking about, I can check your work. Yes. That's, that's exactly why it was seen as being quite important in the kind of open science space, that reproducibility and that te transparency, absolutely. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I want to, hopefully you'll join me in thanking both Anne-Marie and Tony for taking time to explore this new